Habakkuk that we looked at last time, we said was a, a general prophet, one that you sort of generally find with general details. Zephaniah, who follows him, is quite a definite one, specific one. We're even given a brief genealogy of him in verse 1 uh, of chapter 1. We're told uh, where he's come from. He's a descendant of the great king Hezekiah. And there were two awful kings after Hezekiah, and then came a good king, uh, Josiah, uh, who brought in major reforms for the people to return them to the Lord. And it's during his reign that Zephaniah prophesies. But in one sense, you'd hardly know that from the book. For the most part, the tone is quite harsh. The bit we had read is the nice bit at the end, but most of the book is actually quite harsh uh, in tone. During Josiah's reign, the Book of the Covenant was found uh, in the temple. Uh, they began to reform uh, the life of the nation. The book that they're referring to is probably Deuteronomy uh, that they found. And we're going to see as we go through that Zephaniah's prophecy picks up on what was foretold there in Deuteronomy. Uh, what should happen? Should the people break the covenant or keep the covenant? What would happen to the people? And there are at least nine almost direct quotations from the book of Deuteronomy in the book of Zephaniah. So it fits with it being found uh, around this time. And in many ways, the sections dealing with uh, Judah uh, deal with how they should have been compared to what we see they should have been in the book of Deuteronomy. But the big theme for the book is the day of the Lord. Uh, Zephaniah is not the first one to use this term, but he certainly expands our understanding of what it means. So first of all, our first point is the day of the Lord for Judah and the world. That's really what chapter one is about. The book starts with a big promise of God promising to sweep away everything uh, from the face of the earth. Man and beast, bird and fish. It's sort of reversed in order, if you like. Uh, the way that he created it, well, he's reversing that order. It should be fish, bird, beast and man. And he does bird, man, beast, bird and fish as though he's undoing the very creation that he's made. It sounds almost flood language with a promise to wipe everything off the face of the earth. Except, of course, we know from Noah that no flood is coming. But there is the deluge of God's judgment which this is speaking about. And God, with his judgment, starts at home with Judah and their capital city, Jerusalem. He promises to cut off the worship of Baal and other pagan gods and the stars. And in Zephaniah's day, that work had been begun by Josiah. But God will bring it to completion. The day of the Lord is coming, verse 7. And all will be silent, all will be still before the judge of all. That's why we have to be still uh, sung just before. And God's judgment is pictured like a sacrifice. Except it won't be bulls and goats here, but people who are slaughtered. It's quite horrific imagery, really, as you go through. Those who plunder, those who lead the nation astray and run after the nations around them. Even going so far as to dress up like the nations around them. Now, that might not seem like a big deal, uh, but imagine if Joe Biden started dressing like he was from Saudi Arabia or Russia. It's more of a message than a mode of dress, isn't it? It's saying that we associate with the people around us. We're no longer distinct from the nations. And God says those people will be destroyed. They'll be wailing all across Jerusalem at the gates, in the districts. All those who live there and all those who trade there with their silver. It pictures God almost hunting around with a lamp, looking for people. As though he's going to find them in their hiding places. There's no escape here from the judgment of God. And those who denied it could happen, who were complacent and presumed that their special status would save them, that God would never do something like this to them. Well, he tells us their houses will be given to others, and the grapes that they've grown will be used to make someone else's wine. The message is really clear. The day of the Lord is coming. A day of wrath, a day of clouds and thick darkness. And as chapter 1 goes on, it starts to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. As though it's taken on a bigger field than just the invasion of Judah. Now in history, that's what it was. Babylon came and invaded Judah. They pillaged Jerusalem and they carried off the survivors to Babylon. That's what happened in history. That was the day of the Lord for them. But it starts to sound bigger in this chapter. Cosmic, universal. In verse 17, it says that God will bring distress on all mankind and that all the earth shall be consumed in verse 18. 
So the vision Zephaniah has seen will be foreshadowed by the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem. But it will find its final fulfilment in the great day of the Lord that is still to come, when all the world will be judged. And as it says at the end of that chapter, no amount of money will help on that day. No arguing that God would never do this will be any use. Now this is something that must be sorted between us and God before it happens, before that day. Because that day will be too late, says God. And it wasn't just Judah that would be judged on the day of the Lord. So secondly, the day of the Lord for God's enemies. That's really chapter 2, verse 1 to 3, verse 8. Chapter 2 pronounces judgment on Judah's historic enemies. Before that, though, there is a note of grace. They're called to gather together and to seek the Lord, that they may be hidden from the anger of God. The anger will still come, the judgment will still come, but there is this possibility to be hidden from it. God gives this warning even to his enemies and offers them pardon if they will come to him. But for those who will not, judgment is certain. Judgment on the Philistines in chapter 2, 4 to 7. Judgment on Moab and Ammon in 2, 9 to 11. Judgment on Cush in 2, 12. Traditionally it's been called Ethiopia, but its, it's border included the, the east of the Red Sea, uh, which was conquered along the rest when Babylon came. Also judgment on Assyria in chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. The charges against them vary, taunting and reviling God's people and God boasting in their might, talking of themselves as though they were God. So Nineveh saying in verse 15, I am, and there is no one else like me. Sounds really like what God says in Isaiah, doesn't it, about himself. They're making themselves out to be almost gods. But God declares judgment. All these places will be emptied. All the nations will be judged. And of course, this again took place by the hand of the Babylonians as they swept through all those places we've had mentioned in the 7th century BC, during the reign of Josiah's successors. But it might be at this point that Judah might be thinking, well, we can gloat then, you know, all our enemies will be put down. But God adds another one to the list, Jerusalem. And that's in chapter 3. And the verdict is damning. 3 verse 1, Woe to her who is rebellious and defiled, the oppressing city. She listens to no voice. She accepts no correction. She does not trust in the Lord. She does not draw near to her God. And the prophecy goes on to denounce Jerusalem's officials, the judges, the prophets, the priests. We're told that they're fickle, treacherous, profane. That they're like wolves and lions when they should be under shepherds. They should be looking after the sheep. And so, says God, the city will be emptied, cut off. He's warned the city, but in verse 7 he makes it clear that just encourage them to sin more. So God will rise up to seize them and send the nations after them. Nowhere will be safe. There'll be nowhere for the wicked to hide. And again, the image ramps up to a global one. All the earth will be consumed. All will face this terrible day of the Lord. The little, the small day of the Lord that Judah will experience is but a picture of the horror that is to come. Pretty horrific, isn't it? As, as books go, if you think about Zephaniah pronouncing judgment. Which makes the final section all the more surprising. The flip side of the day of the Lord. Verse 9 starts with, at that time. While this awful judgment is happening, God will be gathering. He will be purifying his people's speech that they may call on the name of the Lord. And call on him with one accord, with one voice, together. God promises that his people will not be put to shame. He'll remove the proud and only the humble should be left. So as Jesus put it, the meek really will inherit the land. The proud won't be there. And the language is of sheep grazing peacefully and lying down in a meadow. The wolves and the lions have gone and now the good shepherd will bring them home. And in response to that, the people are called to sing aloud, to rejoice. He's done away with their enemies. He's done away with their sin. And they will now have a king. Not Josiah, but in verse 15, it will be the Lord himself. God will be their king. 
He will come to save his people. He will rejoice over them. He will sing over them loudly. Now, people love this verse, and it's wonderful. But you know what? It's not even a Zephaniah original. Uh, it's actually from Deuteronomy. Uh, it's the fulfillment of Deuteronomy 30, verse 9, to be exact. I'm going to give you it in the New American Standard Bible, because the ESV is disappointingly weak on this one. But Deuteronomy 30, verse 9, says this. This is uh, after they've come back from the exile. Then the Lord your God will prosper you abundantly in every work of your hand, in the children of your womb, the offspring of your cattle, and in the produce of the land. For the Lord will again rejoice over you for good, just as he rejoiced over your fathers. This is what God promised for the people after they failed with the covenant. This is actually God's promise to them when they return. Right the way back in Deuteronomy, he'd already said, you know what? You're going to fail. You're going to be sent out of the land, but I'm going to bring you home. And when I do, this is what I'm going to do. And that's what Zephaniah is looking to, that promise. It's exactly what Zephaniah says God will do here. God will bring them home after he's sent them away and judged them by the Babylonians. He will change their shame to praise. He will bring them home and restore their fortunes. But you've got to be careful, haven't you? We're not the exiles from that century. We've not returned back from Babylon. Uh, some of us might have come back from holiday somewhere, but it probably isn't uh, there. But I think it's probably what Jesus has in mind when he says this in Luke 15, verse 7. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. When someone turns to God in repentance, as the Israelites would do after their exile, Jesus says there's joy in heaven. Heaven rejoices when that happens. More than that, in Luke 15 verse 10, Jesus says this, just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, I think whenever I've read that, I've assumed it's the angels that are rejoicing. You know, you get the mention of the angels. But it says before the angels of God. There is one before the angels of God who is rejoicing over the sinner that repents. Well, isn't that God who is before the angels? God is the one who's rejoicing here over the sinner who repents. And just as the parables that these verses accompany, it's the one who does the seeking who rejoices and invites others then to join in in that rejoicing with him. As I say, we do have to be careful with Old Testament passages like that. We're not the Israelites, but by God's grace, we are sinners who've returned to the Father. And Jesus tells us that for us, God rejoices over with that with gladness. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that that's an individual application of what we see here. It means that God rejoices over you. God rejoices over us. He exults over us with loud singing because we were lost and now we've been found. He changes our shame into praise, even though we were those that were like the lame and the outcast. He gathers us. That's what church is, a gathering of his people around his word in his name. To be gathered is to be blessed. And that's what he's doing here with those people. That's what he does with us into church. To be brought in is to be blessed. But do we know the reality of that? That God rejoices over us with gladness. It's true that we're unworthy. It's true that we're still sinners in that we sin. It's true that we still fall short in so many ways. And yet, it is also true that God rejoices over us with gladness. He is pleased with his children. He delights in his sons and daughters. God knows who we are. He knows what we're like. He's working to change us. But he still rejoices over us in the meanwhile. His love is not a love that says, I love you when you're lovely and lovable. His is a love that loves the unlovely and the unlovable. Love to the loveless shown that they might lovely be. And I'll be honest, I find this one of the hardest things to believe in the Bible, that God would love me. Me? Really me? Who am I that for my sake my Lord should take fell flesh and die, wretched man that I am? And yet believe it, I must. The Lord rejoices over me 
a sinner come to repentance, a son returned home, just as Israel was here, or will be was in the future for them, past for us. But we see, don't we, that the day of the Lord is coming. That is something that is definite. The destruction wrought in history is testimony of that truth. And we can come to God in repentance and be rejoiced over, or we can go out alone and face his wrath. Well, let me finish with some abridged words from 2 Peter chapter 3 that speak about what we should do in the light of the coming day. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, and then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burnt up and dissolved, and the earth and the works that are done in it will be exposed. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to be in lives of holiness and godliness? waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved, and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace, and count the patience of our Lord as salvation, you therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, take care that you are not carried away with the errors of lawless people and lose your own stability, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and to the day of eternity. Well, let's pray that that will be true for us. Let's pray. Father God, we acknowledge that the day of the Lord is coming. Father, we have not lived as we ought to have lived. We have not done as we ought to have done. And yet, Father, we thank you that if we have come to you in faith, you rejoice over us. Father, thank you that you rejoice over the sinner that repents. So, Father, help us to keep coming to you in faith and repentance. Father, we pray for our world. We know that um, your patience means salvation. Help us to use the time before that day to spread the message of the good news of Jesus all across our globe, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.